Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at BreakforthMinistries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. Tom Davis is the former president of Children's Hope Chest and author of three books, including Confessions of a Good Christian Guy. Tom gets specific about the challenges in the lives of good Christian men. Take a courageous look at the secrets often lurking behind victorious Christian facades. We often fall into the temptation of thinking we have all the answers, yet God asks us to walk humbly. Dig into the joy of partnering with those trapped in poverty and allowing them to lead as we listen, support, and walk humbly with them. Now, here's Tom Davis. Father, thank you for a beautiful Edmonton day. And uh, thank you for the grace of your Holy Spirit that works in our lives, that just continues to nudge us in this direction and that direction and bring us to a place where we will say yes to you and give our lives away to you. And so today as we open your word and we see um, what you're doing around the world and we hear some inspiring stories, God, make us one of those inspiring stories for you. Use us in a way that we would change the lives of others, that we could give our life away, that we could be a kingdom man or woman and be able to see your work and the power of your spirit move through our life to change the lives of others. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so this is the, um, the third piece of, I've used this, this verse in Micah 6.8 as a springboard to talk about the issues that, that we're going to wrestle with today. Um, that, that verse is, my, is it says this, that God has shown you, oh man, what is good to love God to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So this is the final piece of, of humility, which I'm, I'm really surprised that so many people showed up for. Um, you never know when you teach on, on humility and you put it on a bulletin uh, in a class what people are actually going to think. But, um, you know, it's, it's one of the key characteristics and the cores of, of a Christian's life. Um, it was of Jesus' life, which we'll see. It's one of the first things he uses humility to tell us. And it's this very simple truth, really, that your life and my life is not our own. And that all of the success that we have in our life and all of the blessings that we have in our life, we all have to walk in a posture of humility and give it away. Give it away first and foremost to God. Give it away to others. Do what we can to be used by him, to realize it's not about us. It's about God's work on earth. Um, I, I think about, I can't help but just think about the Beatitudes when you talk about humility, because what Jesus did is he kind of used the whole concept of how the world functions right in the beginning of his ministry, and he turned it upside down, literally. So he said, all of the things that you think are important, you actually have to do the opposite. Um, my kingdom is not a kingdom of this world. It doesn't operate in the way people think it should operate. And so he lays out the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, which was really an interesting way to start out his ministry. It says, uh, Matthew 5, 1, when he saw the crowds, he went up to a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, people are thinking to be poor in spirit, that's not a good thing, that's a bad thing. But Jesus says, no, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I, over and over, I've heard people that we've, we take thousands of people a year over on trips, and they go into these environments where they're the poorest of the poor and the most difficult circumstances, and they're caring for orphans and loving on all these kids, and they come out and they say the same thing every time. I have never, ever felt the presence of God the way that I feel it when I'm, I'm, I'm ministering to these people. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for those are the kingdom of heaven. I mean, God dwells with them in a very intimate, very real way. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, 
the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsify all kinds of things of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus is automatically saying, listen, there is a different ethic, a different standard that I want you to live by. I want you to be people who don't take credit for things. God, it says in the Bible that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I want you to use your lives in ways that may be radically different from the ideas that you had for your life because I have different plans for your life. I want you to walk in humility. Uh, the idea of humility, and in, in Micah 6, 8, it means something very simple. It, it means that when we see the standard that God has for our lives, right, when he calls us to be people of justice, when he calls us to care for the poor, when he, cares, when he calls us to give our lives away for others, and we see that our lives aren't matching up to that, that in humility, we walk in such a way that we bring our lives into the standard that God is calling us to. Um, I can't think of a better way to start talking about humility than to show you an example of one lady who, who lives this out more than almost anybody that I know. Uh, her name is Anathy. And I told you, we work in a number of, of countries. And one of the things that we do is we try to create different scenarios for orphans than they would have had had we or somebody like you not been walking side by side with them and helping them. Well, India is one of the poorest nations on the earth. I'm wondering how many people have been to India. Okay, a, a handful. Um, it's one of the biggest populations on the earth, but it's incredibly poor. Uh, even in the middle class, uh, when you go to a middle class home, many times you'll step over the sewage to get to the house. Um, in the poor places, it, it's just in the slums. If you've seen the movie Slumdog Millionaire, uh, you get a little bit of an idea of what, what happens in India and how poor it can actually be. And, and what, what goes on is that, you know, the number one killer of children in India is diarrhea. It kills thousands of kids every day, which comes primarily from drinking dirty water. Uh, India is one of the places that uh, I, I, I love India. I love the people, but I, I, I don't quite understand why they do what they do sometimes. The, the, the rivers are the places where the, where the sewage empties out into. And so they're black and then they'll burn, you know, they have the burning rituals, the Hinduism rituals where they burn people. And then the, those decomposing bodies that aren't quite burned end up in the river, right? The holy river in India is called what? The Ganges River. And so all of, every, basically everything in India ends up in the river. And people all the time joke because when they go on trips, you have to be really careful you, you, with the water you drink, obviously, but also the food you eat because you can get really sick really easy. They call it Delhi belly, you know, like the, the city of Delhi. So if you've been there, you know that. You have to be, be very careful. And, and so um, one time we were, we, you know, on, on this one river that was like the Ganges where a lot of this was happening and, I, um, and, and people were washing their clothes in the river. And I thought, well, no big deal. But then they, they, they took a, a vegetable cart and they're pushing the vegetable cart there and they take the vegetables that were on a nice thing, looked like they're in a restaurant. They were washing them in the river. I was like, ah, deli belly. That's where that comes from. Um, but the people of India are very resourceful. Uh, very, very, I mean, they have some of the best schools in the world that would rival um, Harvard, MIT, some of those kinds of institutions. But the problem is, is if you come from poverty, you have no way of ever, ever having those kinds of opportunities. And so when we're talking about issues of justice, uh, we're talking about providing people opportunities and helping them to do things that they couldn't do unless we came alongside of them and, and did it. Well, I want to put you in a scenario that Anathi was in. Uh, Anathi is a very respectable Indian woman. Uh, she has worked very hard all of her life to overcome her own poverty that she grew up with, and she has a PhD in education. So she had dreams of being a university professor. Um, I wonder what some of, some of your dreams are about what, you know, where you are in life and maybe what you want to accomplish still and, and, and where your visions are, your dreams are. I mean, these were her visions and her dreams. But she was confronted with something that was very different. And as a Christian, she had to respond 
in a way that, that she wasn't even necessarily comfortable with, but is the most beautiful example of humility and giving your life away that I know of. And we've captured her story that I'd like to show you on video. So um, it, it, you, she speaks in English. You'll be able to hear, even though the sound system's not great, but we've also put the words up there so you'll be able to read it too. So um, you get the best of both worlds if you're in the back. Hopefully you'll still be able to hear it. So watch this with me. I am Ananti Jebasi. Our family was in South India and I was teaching in a college. My husband was in ministry and he took charge of Transworld Radio and we all moved to Delhi. We had three children. During this time, one boy came knocking at the door and he was a beggar boy. He was begging for food. He was so sweet to my eyes and of the age of my son. So I was kind to him and I told him I'll give him something to eat. And every day he came and every day I saved something from breakfast and gave that to him. One day when I opened the door, there were nearly 25 children, all dirty, all uh, so filthy. And I looked at them, instead of compassion pouring out of my heart, I felt irritated that day. And I was asking, why? Why did you come? And they were already fearful at that time. And one little girl said in a weak voice, Bhuk lagreha. Bhuk lagreha means, we are hungry or I am hungry. But I got angry and I just told them, I am not here to make you beggars. I don't want you to be beggars. And I will not give you anything to eat. So I shut the door and walked in. But that was the time Lord intervened in my life. He just spoke to me through the words of that little girl. We are hungry. We are hungry. I realized God was talking to me. And I was asking him, what? What is it, Lord? What should I do? I have sent away the children. He just said, they are my lambs and I want you to feed them. And I surrendered my life into his hands. I should do something different for these children. I will ask him to sit with me for some time and learn. And I told the boy, if you learn, if you get educated, then you, it will be good for your life. And the boy agreed. And we started our little class in the garage of our home. But then many parents came to me and they were all holding children, three, four in their hands. And they were asking me to admit the children in the school. I told them this is an apartment. This is a garage. This is not a school. I'm just trying to help. And I cannot admit the children here. But they were pleading with me. There is no school for our children. There is no one to take care of our children. Can you keep them for some time? But this broke my heart. And I agreed to keep the children in the garage. And this became the first little school. And I came to know about the plight of uh, the children across the road who were living in the slum. And even then, children came from the slum. They sat in front of the house, apartment, on the road, and they would say, we will not go until you give us admission. Then, more people joined, and then we all went to the slum commissioner. There is so much demand for education. They want to come to school, but there is no school. So when we told that to him, he said, I will help because I myself am from the slum. So we value your help. And then he asked a question. There is a toilet complex across your place in the slum. Can you take the room in the toilet complex? I was stunned. Because toilet complex was used by thousands of people 
every day to relieve themselves. And uh, for one kilometer around, you cannot walk. The bad smell will emanate from there. And he was asking me to go in and teach the children. Unthinkable for a decent woman. But when I was just struggling with my feelings, the major scene came across my mind. It was just passing like a film. And I realized when God of Gods, the Lord of Lords, can come down for me into a manger. How can I say, how can I dare to say that I cannot enter this toilet complex? I just shook my face and then I told him, yes sir, we will take that room. But children were happy and children could sit on the desk and they were really very happy to be there. Instead of playing on defecation, instead of playing on dirt, they had a place where they could sit. So the school in the toilet complex grew in number. It was difficult to run the school in a toilet complex. On either side, the, there were toilets, one side for women and one side for men. And it was people used to throw their waste garbage in front of the school. But even then, Slowly it grew, we were allowed to put tents and we had 650 children coming to the school every day in morning and afternoon sessions. And the teachers were working hard and children, the faces were becoming brighter and brighter once they enter. Though it was crowded, the classroom was crowded, there was star in their eyes and it brought so much joy to her heart. Anyway. The slum was going to be demolished and people will be thrown out and we had to think of something to have these children in school. Then the slum was demolished and within three months the school was also demolished. So our school continued on the streets, it continued on for two full years. We were doing the, the teachers were in the rain, the children were in the rain, they were exposed to the heat, they were exposed to the wind, they were exposed to the dust. But so much of sacrifice was involved and the children continued their education. And all the children in the toilet complex, 650 of them were praying for this, fasting and praying that they will have a school. And it was a daunting task. And everywhere, it was the Lord who went in front of us. And when the school was completed in Jasola, it was a great day. People who helped, people who had come to the toilet complex, when they came to the road and looked up at the school, they cried. Everyone cried. It was a moment of thanksgiving to the Lord for what God has accomplished. Out of nothing, he brought everything into being. When they come to the school, a remarkable change comes over the children. Discipline, love for God, and looking at things in a different way. So there is hope, there is joy in them. And this building has a capacity of 2,200 children at one time. And if we get permission for two shifts, then we can have 4,400 children. And our vision and our desire in the Lord is to fill this place with the needy children who have no hope otherwise. And they come here, come to know about the living God who loves them, come here get the best education they can have in India and then go out with a certificate which allows them to take admission in any university in the world. From one single child, God has taken us through the toilet complex experience, the street teaching experience to a very, very good facility. And He has provided for this all through. So a, 
a family of righteousness is growing and we are thankful to the lord for that but i ask myself this question as it relates to humility as it relates to my life being my own if god called me see i, I mean i i'm like her pursued education just about you know i have a masters degree i'm just about to finish my doctorate that she she trumps me she has a phd and god called me through a series of circumstances to teach children in a toilet complex what i do it would you do it it's a tough question it's a tough question it's what she was given to do i mean it's what god had brought to her it's what was before her and and i mean what an incredible i mean she didn't have any hope. I mean, she comes from a a poor background her her husband is a church planter in india and there was no no hope no ability to be able to figure out what what rich person do i know to build this i mean, how, I mean it was all a miraculous circumstance that came to pass in order for anathi to do that and she didn't just teach i mean it, i can imagine okay okay god if i had to maybe a couple weeks but she did this for over a decade in the toilet complex. Oh, by the way, if you've um not been to India, uh in Texas where I'm from, well I'm I'm from Dallas. And so um but Texas can get hot. Right? And I mean in Dallas the heat can be excruciating. The year that we finally moved from Texas to Colorado, we had to go to some <laughs> cooler weather. Um we that year it there were 80 days of no rain in that summer and over 100 days of 100 degree or more heat. Right? I don't know what that translates Fahrenheit. Hot. Yes, very hot. Well, they say they say Texas heat doesn't compare anywhere close to Indian heat. I mean, it's hot. So when you think about these kids out in the streets and in a toilet complex that is not very sanitary, you can imagine what she what she went through, right? I know it's kind of gross, but it's real. I mean, I cannot think of a woman who walks in more humility, who say, you know what, Lord, whatever you bring into my life, I, I, I'll do it. And you know what's interesting is that so for all of us who, in this room, we're Christ followers, I assume, most of us at least, and you know, we all are, are utilizing our lives to be more reflective of Christ's life, right? I mean, we want to serve him more. We want, to, you know, we want him to open up new worlds to us. We don't do it perfectly, right? but we want to continue to change and to grow. And, but this is the characteristic and nature of Jesus, even what he did. And in Philippians 2, it talks about this whole concept of humility. And, and why does Anathy do what she does? And why did she do? I mean, it's a lot easier now. Granted, they still don't have air conditioning in that beautiful building, um, but they have shade. They have fans. But look what God has been able to do, but it's because she walked in humility. And for her, this is just, you know, this is part of the walk. It was difficult. I mean, she didn't want to at first. She told you she chased the kids away. I mean, even though this woman is like Mother Teresa, she was like, get out of here. I'm not going to make you beggars anymore. And I don't know if you could see the tears streaming down her face as she told that story, but it, that's how real it is to her. But this is what we read about, about, the, about Jesus that Paul writes about in Philippians 2, when he talks to us about how we're to conduct our lives and what our attitude is to be. Listen to this. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, although being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself made himself of nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. He was found in appearance as a man and humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't you love that verse? I mean, here, here Jesus isn't requiring anything out of us that he's not, not already done. Uh, what she's doing, Anathy, is just following in the footsteps of Jesus. Who, And I think of that concept, and that's what was going on with her when she tells about the manger scene and what God did in, in her through that, through that vivid image, is that here Jesus leaves all of heaven's glory, the goodness, the safety, the wonderful things we, we can't even imagine. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard the things God has prepared for us. We have no idea what that looks like. 
But yet Jesus did, and he left it. He was born in a manger, in a feeding trough, in a gross, disgusting feeding trough. He could have been born in a palace. He could have been born somewhere else, but instead he was born in a manger. And in Philippians, it says that he, that was humility. He humbled himself. And though he was equal with God, considered equality with God, not something to be grasped, but lowered himself. Why? Took on a form of a servant for you and for me. And so when she's saying that she was arguing with God about the toilet complex, it's because she saw this image of Jesus and all that he left. And if he can come and give his life and be nailed to a cross and be born in a manger, then she can teach kids in a toilet complex. That's humility. That is humility. And all of us are called to walk in those areas in our life. They're going to be uncomfortable. You know, even the things that my wife and I have done in life have never been easy. I, when I tell the stories, they sound like, uh, you know, it's such a wonder, wonderment of, of oh, oh, of course, God, like we adopted from Russia and we did all this stuff. And and it sounds like it was so easy, but you, it's not. I mean, it means it's a struggle at times. I mean, Jesus struggled with things. N- nevertheless, he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And, you know, there's so many things that God brings into our life, but if we can keep the spirit of humility and this understanding that, that we are people of compassion and kindness and our life doesn't belong to us, it changes everything and it's the greatest blessing that we could ever have. Uh, you know, speaking of this whole idea of compassion, because out of a, a humble heart comes a compassionate heart, which is what I really want to, to motivate you to be people of compassion, no matter, you know, where you are in life or no matter what you do, no matter what's going on. Uh, you know, I, I, I remember so clearly that, that my journey in all of this began because I thought I was going to be a pastor of this huge church. And that's kind of, you know, I was going to be very comfortable in Dallas there's this church called Hillcrest Church, and it was planted um, in the middle of one of the, the wealthiest communities in the country. It was a real sacrifice to plant the church there. And um, <laughs> with, of course, the understanding that those people needed the gospel too. But uh, here we had built this humongous church, and I was kind of the succession, and I was, I was in line to, you know, to be next. And, and um, I knew the pastor was making really good money, and I was like, oh, it's not too bad. If you're going to be a pastor, you might as well make good money too. I mean, this and Dallas is the home of some of the biggest churches. I mean, there's one called Preston World. It's Preston Wood uh, Church that houses almost 30,000 people. It's in like, a, like an arena. And um, so you can imagine, I mean, these pastors have almost celebrity status in, in those areas. And, and so it was, it, was, it was the whole idea of reading these kinds of scriptures and reading scriptures about the, the poor and how much God loves them and pure and undefiled religions caring for orphans, that kind of got me going in a different direction. And I, like Anathy, when we were confronted in Russia, uh, some of you have heard this story, and those of you, this is your first time in your session, haven't, so excuse me, i tell a little bit about that story. But um, what we decided to do, because we didn't know, we saw all these scriptures on caring for the poor and widows and orphans, and we didn't know where to find them. I mean, I was in you know, my early 20s, so I'm like, where do you find orphans? We didn't have a way to minister to foster care kids, so we ended up going to Russia. And, and you know, for us, that was a trip. Like, we were excited. We were going to go out of the country and raise all this money, and we took a group of 35, a lot of kids and parents. But what we were confronted with caused us to say, are we going to humble ourselves and change and walk in a different form of life, or are we going to keep doing things that we were always doing? And we found out that all of these millions of kids in these orphanages, that 70% of them would get out of the orphanage and they would be victims of human trafficking or enforced prostitution. Um, I, I showed a lot of those videos. I don't have time to in here, but if you go to the Hope Chest website, you'll see stories of girls who have been trafficked and can come out of those situations because somebody like you helped provide a way out or, or a home, a transitional center, whatever that happened to look like. And so we're confronted with this, and then we have to decide. I had to decide. My wife had to decide. Are we going to continue to live our lives the way that we've always lived them? With the dreams that we always thought that were more selfish that we realized at that point, are, are we going to open up to this world that God has for us? And, and it takes humility to do it. And a lot of times I think humility is really, I mean, the door gets lower and lower and you keep banging your head against it because you forget that you're supposed to bow. I mean, it takes, it, it takes time. It's not an easy, easy thing to do. And so what ended up happening is that my wife and I um, are open. Uh, to, we, we meet all of these kids, 150 of these kids, and we start to hear their stories. And you can imagine, they're like little kids who tell you that, oh, and I want to grow up. You know, I want to be a, a police officer. 
um, are, when I grow up, I, I want to be a scientist. And they had all these dreams that they wanted, but the statistics told a totally different story because they would leave the orphanage at 15 to 16 and they would end up committing suicide, 15% of them. 70% of the girls end up in prostitution, as I said. 80% of the boys end up living in prison or in the streets. And so now I'm confronted with, here are these kids that God's brought unto our path. What do we do? How do we live our life the way Christ called us to into something that was different than what we had planned? And what we had planned, because I'm an only child, and my wife comes from a family of six. And so I really wanted kids, and she loved you know, kids, so we wanted a big family. And so we were going to have our own kids, and you know, because I, I, I wanted my Davis name to live on. I had all these ideals, and, and um, in that environment, we met this little girl. Her name was Anya, and we started to hear her story. And she was so innocent and so beautiful and so cute, and we knew that she was going to get out and probably be a victim of, of human trafficking. The, the UN says that 1.2 million children are pulled into human trafficking every year, every single year. Um, 300,000, by the way, in case you think it's not here, are on the streets of Canada and the United States. Um, especially your port cities, Vancouver, all of those places that have waterways, they're going to be everywhere. Dan Rather, you probably don't know that name. He was like a huge anchor in America, and he's in his 70s now, and he did an undercover story on trafficking in the United States in Portland, Oregon. And he thought, when he went into this, he said, there's no way that girls are actually trafficked in Portland, Oregon. No way. I mean, yes, trafficking in Russia and in Cambodia and these other places. You know, when uh, we, we work in Cambodia as well, I was talking to somebody about it. The trafficking is so pervasive in Cambodia that when you get off of the airplane and you get in a car and you drive one mile down the road and for about another five mile stretch, there are little girls, I'm talking eight, nine years old, who are in brothels right there at the street, sitting there waiting for men to come pick them out. And that's, that's how prevalent that it is in Cambodia. So, so Dan Rather's thinking, well, of course, in those kinds of places, but not in Portland. And so he goes undercover and he goes with an FBI agent and he realizes that, that these internet, the internet has made traffickers, it's a heyday for traffickers. They can meet vulnerable girls. They ship girls over from Asia, from Russia, from Eastern Europe. And he discovers this whole insidious, disgusting world of human trafficking right in Portland. And he goes, if you would have told me that a girl could be at home on a computer and meet the wrong person and be a victim of human trafficking in the United States of America, I would have told you that would have never happened. But after I've gone undercover and discovered this, I'm here to tell you that it happens every single day in the streets of the United States. Well, what do you do when you're confronted with that? I mean, as a father, as a mother, grandfather, I mean, you, I mean that, that, you can't help but to have compassion about something like that. So when we met all of these kids here, my wife and I, even though we were, we were newly married, we were young, we had a baby, we were confronted with what do we do? And so when we met this little girl and heard her story and started to see, I, I literally got visions of her having to be put in, for, in, in, in these terrible scenarios and being a victim of human trafficking. We decided to adopt her into our, into our home. And so at 22 and 26 years old, uh, we ad- decided to adopt a 10-year-old girl who then, uh, you had to be, this is what was funny about Russian law, is you had to be 16 years older than the child. And I was, and my wife wasn't. And so we went from our ideal of what life was with our little bouncing baby boy to adopting Anya the next year, who was 11 years old, pregnant with our next, and my wife's two siblings coming to live with us. Because her, both of her parents died tragically at a it was a terrible situation. I don't have time to go into, but she was orphaned and so they were left alone. So our, our lives went from one to five overnight because we opened up our heart and said, God, whatever you need, I mean, how are we going to live our lives that are different than what ordinarily people live? Uh, Henry Nouwen has this, has this statement about compassion that I absolutely love because all of us want to be compassionate people, right? You want to be compassionate. Who, who wants to be compassionate? You want to be known as that. I mean, I'd like for that to be, you know, a, a legacy that I leave my children. That Tom Davis was a person who lived compassionately to the best of his ability, not perfectly, but cared about other people and tried, tried as hard as he could to be compassionate and lay his life down for others. But do you know what the word actually means? It, it comes from two words, cum pati. It means to suffer with. Now who wants to be compassionate? 
It means to suffer with. It means that you have to actually get into the boat with other people and their circumstances. And, and it takes time and it takes effort and it takes making different decisions. It means you have to sign up for it. You have to say, God, use me to be an instrument in someone else's life. That's what Henry Nouwen says. Let us not underestimate how hard it is to be compassionate. Compassion is hard because it requires the inner disposition to go with others to places where they are weak, vulnerable, and lonely and broken. This is not our spontaneous response to suffering, but what we desire most is to do away with suffering by fleeing from it or finding a quick cure for it. So it takes time. It takes effort. It takes going into these places and making a difference. You know, I, I, I have a message that I, I, I've titled seeing what God sees. And I try to think of this every day. You know, when I get up in the morning, we, in fact, I'm getting texts right now about my kid's soccer. He's playing in Las Vegas, Nevada. And so we have, we have uh, seven children, two adopted daughters now, five biological kids. Our day starts out really crazy. I'm sure like yours does whatever, whatever capacity. So you have your job and you've got your kids, you got to get in soccer practices and run in here and figuring out how to do this. I got to get on, I got to, people are meeting me at 3.15 in the morning, take me to the airport, crazy things all the time in life. And we have a tendency to get caught up in routine and forget to see the world the way that God sees the world. And he wants us to be people of compassion who walk in humility that make a difference in the life of other people. Uh, in fact, I think one of the main reasons that we are on the earth are to be an extension of God's love and his hope and his kindness and his goodness and his justice. A absolutely. We talked in the first session about justice and, and we had this whole idea of all of these problems in the world that I could just regurgitate one after another. I told you about the sex trafficking thing. 15,000 children dying every day under the age of five because of malnourishment, right? Nobody dies from malnourishment in North America. There are 330 million people don't have access to clean water. Millions of people will die this year because of drinking dirty water. Solvable, easy problems, relatively. Malaria, 2 million people will die because of death by mosquito bite. Because they don't have the 5 to 6 to $7 it takes for the medicine to be able to take and cure them from this disease. So they'll lose their life. A child will lose a dad, lose a mom, because they don't have access to things that we have access to. And, and then we looked at the whole idea that, that, are these problems too big? And I read some statistics that were very interesting on how much money North Americans, includes you, right, pay for things like perfume, $17 billion, perfume and cologne last year. Dog food, $15 billion last year. Uh, makeup, $18 billion last year, right? Nothing wrong with makeup, nothing wrong with cologne, nothing, but that's a lot of money. Well, the Borgen Report did a study about, well, what would it look like to cure some of the biggest problems in the entire world? I mean, what, like, like, like literacy, like clean water. You know what they found? $15 billion takes care of all the water problems in the world. Same amount that we spend on perfume and cologne. To educate every child, $10 billion. I mean, this is not something that is out of the realm of possibility. The fact is, is that there are too few compassionate people. There are too few people who call themselves by the name of a Christian who really don't walk in the ways that giving their life away that Christ called them to do. And, and then you start to think about like all the people who are called Christians in the world, if just 7% would take the time to reach out and to love somebody, whether it's adopting them or into their home or caring for them or ministering, whatever, there would be no orphan problem in the world. We are God's agents to take care of of some of the most vulnerable people in our societies. The question is, are we willing? Are we willing to humble ourselves, to lay our lives down, to realize that, you know what? I'm here for a great purpose. It's to bring God's kingdom to others. It's to be a person of kindness, compassion, and love, and to make a difference in their life. I want to show you this, this last video and, um, because it clear, clarifies this whole message that I've been talking about today of, of acting justly and loving mercy and walking, walking humbly before God. Because of onathies in the world, there are kids that are going to the MITs of India. You know, what's interesting about her school is that less than 10% of the schools in India are Christian. And of those, less than a handful actually have accreditation through the state. 
They do. Kids, she said, can go anywhere in the world. They're getting their lives changed. They're Christian because someone stepped in and cared. And I know we all can't be an honesty, but we all can help one person. You know, John 10.10 says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And one of the things that we don't realize many times is that there's a spiritual battle that's going on behind what we can see with our physical eyes. And one of the places that I have seen the thief kill, steal, and destroy almost without any resistance is in the lives of children like this. That's why sex trafficking is the number one biggest business in the world, because there's no one standing in the gap for these kids, not enough people, certainly. And somehow the enemy is so wicked and so, so sleazy that he will take care, he will take out the most vulnerable among us. He will subject children to horrendous things like that. He, he's involved in those areas. And so the, Jesus says, though, that I have come that they might have life and life abundant. What is the difference between the thief killing, stealing, and destroying and the abundant life that Jesus has promised? He didn't just promise that to you and I. That's a universal promise to these kids, to people in India that are so, I mean, that is a universal promise. The difference, the gap is people like you who say, you know what, I am going to follow God in places that might be uncomfortable. They might be toilet complexes. Now, probably it's not going to be a toilet complex. But in places that I didn't, you know, that, were, that are a stretch for me, get me out of my comfort zone, that, that force me to use my gifts and what God has done to help the life of somebody else be changed. But don't you think it's worth it? I mean, if you could think about the fact that God would be able to use your life to make a difference in someone else's, like the kids that you've seen, just normal people that help those kids. And by you just saying, okay, God, I am, I'm going to walk this out and I'm going to find a way, or you're going to show me a way, or something's going to occur where I can help kids like this, no matter what I do, no matter what I do. Because I often think of when I'm standing before God and that this world is no more. All of us are going to be there, right? We're going to be before God's throne. Jesus tells us this in Matthew 25. I think about what I'm going to have done that's really going to have mattered. You ever thought about that? You know, it's those whole thing, the whole thing of Jesus saying, you know, I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. The things that matter, I was hungry and you fed me. I wonder how many kids will be standing around the throne room because you cared about their life. Because you said, God, could you use me to help the life of somebody else? Could you... Could I be able to, from Canada, from Edmonton, from wherever I live, maybe not even being, I can't travel, but could you still use me to make a difference? And I'm convinced that God is, God's plan for humanity, for poverty, for the rescue of girls from trafficking, to keep girls from trafficking, are you and I. It's you and I. It's people like you and me who do something to make a difference. There's this little boy I know named Teraku. Teraku was adopted from Ethiopia. He is about um, that tall. He's about eight years old and 150 pounds. Uh, he's, he was adopted by some good friends of mine, Ben and Amy Savage. Actually, Ben, ben works at Children's Hope Chest. And Teraku comes from these situations, and he's hilarious. I mean, he's so mature that the joke is that he actually, you know, he's not really a, an orphan who was adopted, and he's not really eight years old. He owns a taxi cab company in Addis Ababa. <laughs> Very bright, incredible kid. Well, Tereku, um, now remember, this kid, he's just been adopted a short time ago, about two years ago. He, he knows what this is like. And he hears these messages, and he hears the word of God, and he sees these videos. And he says, he comes, and he says, Mama, Dada. He said, I want to do something for my birthday this year that matters to other people. And Tereku decided single-handedly to take on a project because he knew that there had been some kids from the village where he came from that had died from drinking dirty water. Why? Because there was a tannery plant that tans leather. Uh, I've been to this place, this river, it, like it putrid, it smells so bad. And what happens at certain times of year is that the company dumps the chemicals in the water and the people, that's the only water that they have access to, will drink that water and unfortunately it takes their life. So Teraku knew about this. And so he decided this year he wanted to use his birthday as a way not to get presents for himself, but he wanted to take on the project of raising over $5,000 for a water well in Ethiopia in the village that he was from. 
So we helped him make a video and he put it online and through Facebook and we created a little blog for him to tell his story and he started telling his story and, and he's told his story in school. Well, Tariku not only raised enough money for one well, but two wells in that community. Eight-year-old little boy adopted from Ethiopia. You see, I look at that and that to me is the light of the world. That is the hope of the world. I mean, the Bible says that we were created for good works. These are the kind to glorify our Father in heaven. It gives God glory when we, when we do good works. And these are the kinds of good works that we do. And we love people and we care and we make differences and we raise money for water wells. And it's also a form of spiritual warfare. Every time you sponsor a kid from Compassion or wherever, you're, that's a form of spiritual warfare, beating back the enemy. Every time you write a letter and you speak life into somebody, that might be the only prayer covering that kids ever have. No one's praying for these orphans overseas. And if we realized, if, if we realized how much power we have, not in ourselves, but in the Christ that we love and that we serve who lives in us. I mean, the Bible tells us that the resurrection power raised Jesus from the dead, lives in us. If we knew how powerful we were in that capacity, we, there's nothing we couldn't do. There's no problem that couldn't be solved. We could solve the clean water problem, the education problem, the trafficking problem. Just by being people of humility and mercy and justice. What does that look like for you? Uh, I've ended every session like this, and I'm going to end this one like this, because, because I firmly believe that you're the hope of the world. God knows you're the hope of the world. He doesn't have a plan B. There isn't a bunch of angels that are going to come descend and take care of all of these kinds of issues in our communities and around the world. It's going to be people like you and people like me that are going to do it. What we need is some Holy Ghost energy and courage to step out and say, God, okay, I, I, I'm doing it. This, this is the day. And I've heard so many stories from people. We're going to go, you know, we've been called to this ministry. We're going. We're, I'm, Brazil's on our heart. We're going back. We're doing all of these things because that's what God wants us. And what if he brought you here just for that purpose? To say, I'm with you that burden that's on your heart about these issues, I, you step out. I'm going to provide money. I'm going to provide the ability. And you're going to see me do incredible things through your life. So I want you to just pray as we end real quickly and say, God, whatever that is, whatever my role is, use me and I'll obey you wherever you call me. Father, uh, thanks for just a wonderful time of, of looking at the lives of other people and the encouragement that their stories are and the truth of your word, how you call us to be people of humility. You call us to walk before you and in ways that are different from everybody else. We are a peculiar people. And so, Lord, we pray that you would flood this place with your spirit. You would speak to us. You would reveal to us how we can change the world, how we can take the spirit of Christ that's in us and let him shine in ways that we never have before so that lives are changed. And I pray that you would show each and every one in this room the one thing that they can begin doing to change the life of one kid, to keep them out of trafficking, to keep them from drinking dirty water. God, we can be used for so many incredible things. Now use us, Father, as we give our lives to you. We surrender freely. And wherever you call, we will follow. We ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at BreakForthMinistries.com where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, may you become fully alive in the love of God.